So I've been a master gardener now for about three years, and um, it is actually an organization that is a service organization. It is an organization that helps you as homeowners be able to, to be better gardeners. So that's our whole purpose in life, right? So today we're going to talk about the garden that keeps on giving, or also known as perennial food gardening. So does anybody have an idea of what that is? Things that you plant that come back every year. Things that you plant that come back every year. So actually, what, I'm, forgot. We're going to talk a little bit about per, what is perennial food gardening. We're going to define that. We're going to give you a couple of definitions so that as I say these, some of these words, you'll understand what I mean. Um, we're going to have, talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of perennial food gardening. And then we are going to actually spend the majority of our time this morning talking about various plants that you might want to use as a perennial food grower. All right, so this is kind of my definition. This is growing food plants that you plant once but harvest over many years. That's my definition. I didn't, I, I made that up, right? So don't like try to Google that particular phrase and you <laughs> make it something different. So, but the idea is this is something that, these are plants that you grow specifically to produce food, but you only plant, you plant them once and they will produce for more than one year. Right, so that's kind of my definition of what we're talking about today. Um, so a couple of other definitions that I want to make sure that you understand, first of all, is annual. An annual plant is something that completes its life cycle in one year. Now what I mean by that is this is a plant that, that you plant. So think of impatience, right, the flower impatient. You plant it once and and in the winter, it dies, right? So it doesn't come back the next year, right? Unless you plant it again. A perennial, though, is a plant that actually lives, and, and this definition is a little bit wrong. Um, this says it lives for two years or more. A perennial is technically a plant that lives for more than two years because there's also a biannual, which its life cycle is two years. Right, so, and, and, I'm, and I'm giving you these definitions because we're going to talk a little bit about that, these kinds of things as we go through this presentation, and I want to make sure that, that these are terms that you're familiar with and you understand what they mean, right? So, and then the final one I want to talk about is a self-seeding plant. This is a flowering plant that will grow back every year from seed, right? So you might have lettuce. I'm going to use lettuce as an example. Lettuce, you plant it and it dies back in the winter. So you think, right? So, but it doesn't. It has produced, if you don't pull it out, it will produce a flower, which will then produce seeds, and then the seeds will actually regrow the next year. Right, so that's what I mean by self-seeding. Weeds, a lot of our weeds are self-seeding. Uh, right? <laughs> um, they do a really good job. Harry Bittercress is like my nemesis. You know, that's the little ones that's coming up right now that's kind of this little rosette of flower, little yeah. tiny leaves and a little white flower. They self seed, right? Um, they don't. <laughs> over and over. They will self seed within the same year, actually. <laughs> Um, so those are some definitions, and we have, we have some of the plants that I consider perennial food plants are actually annual plants, but they're self-seeding, and so we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into some of the other the plant examples. So advantages. What do you think is an advantage of planting food crops once and then harvesting them for multiple years? Anybody got any ideas? Less cost. Time and money. Time and money. Less effort, I think you said? Oh, Continuous no. food stream. Okay, so, so let me t go through the ones that I had. You guys actually came up with a couple that I did not, but and that's great. Um, you avoid the spring plow plant purchase, purchase plant cycle, right? So I actually have, I only plant it once and I don't have to replant it again. You know, you think about, okay, right now it's April and I don't want to go out and play in my garden when it's only 30 degrees. Right, which it was 29 when I got up this morning. Right, so, so we avoid that, and it's very wet. We have a very wet spring here. Right, so, 
if you you avoid having to till up your garden every year, right? So you avoid that annual cycle. You also reduce your fall cleanup because you know you don't have to do you don't have to pull all those plants out at the end of the year. You extend your harvest. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means, right? Because a lot of the perennial food plants you only harvest one time a year. So you're not really extending your harvest time, but you are getting some harvest earlier in the year. And I want to I want to actually give you some examples of things that I actually picked in my yard this morning. So this, it's small, but you could put this, this is red kale. So you could put that in a salad, right? This is another kind of kale. Actually, sorry, this one is collards. I do have another kind of kale in here. This is, anybody know what this is? Rhubarb, right? So with rhubarb, you know you eat the stem, not the leaf, right? right? <laughs> the, the leaf is actually toxic, it's poisonous. So, but it, it's small, but I could eat it, right? So anybody got any, any annual of their garden going yet? This is thyme, right? So I've had thyme, I've been able to pick thyme all winter. I just had to unbury it from the snow a couple of times, but. Here's my other kale. Oregano. More kale. And sage. Right, so these are all things, and, and I could have had other th examples if I were growing them, but those are things that I actually have in my yard that I was able to pick this morning. So that's what I mean by extended harvest, right? So a lot of your perennial, especially greens and herbs, come up very early in the year, um, and so therefore they, you, you do get things a little earlier than you would if you were planting from seed. There is also ornamental value in a lot of our perennial plants, right? So that red kale that I, I showed you, it, it was this beautiful four foot high curly red kale in my flower garden last year. It was beautiful, right? So there is definitely ornamental value in a lot of these plants, right? And then there are some plants that are only available as a perennial, right? You can't grow rhubarb or apples or blackberries unless it's, you know, you're planting them once with the expectation of getting them again. Disadvantages. Everything has advantages and disadvantages, right? So a disadvantages is it has to be a permanent location. Don't plant your perennial vegetables in the middle of your annual vegetable garden. If you do, you're going to end up digging them up and then that kind of defeats the purpose, right? So it needs to be a dedicated permanent place just like your flower garden or your bush, your, your row of shrubs, right? It's a dedicated location. Some of them, most of them will take several years to get established before you can actually produce, um, start harvesting them. Some become weeds, right? Just like that hairy bittercress, that self-sower, especially the, the self-sowing ones, um, and some of the herbs as well, they become very weedy, right? And even like raspberries and blackberries can really take over if you're not careful, right? There are some pest issues that you have to worry about that are specific to more of the perennial plants, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. And some of them have very strong flavors, and so the, these are flavors that we are not necessarily as familiar with or comfortable with in our American diet. All right, so that's the preamble. Now we're going to get into the fun part of talking about actual plants that you can use. All right, so the first thing in perennials is a tree. Does anybody believe that a tree is a perennial? No. Right, so you plant it once and it grows for a lot of years, right? So what kinds of trees produce food? Fruit trees. So fruit trees, apples, pears, cherries. Parsimons is another one that's actually native to this area and not real familiar to us, but it is one, another one that's an option. Nuts, walnuts, hazelnuts, there are more. There's a lot more options than the ones that, are, that I've listed here. These are ones that are relatively 
Um, easy to grow, or relatively commonly grown in this area, but they're not the only ones, right? Advantages of trees, they're, they're beautiful, especially the fruit trees. You think about, they are, we plant some of these just for spring flowering beauty, right? The cherry trees, we plant cherries that don't produce any ed really good cherry trees just to see the spring flowers, right? Um, they produce shade. Walnuts, hazelnuts, and some of the, you know, so they're, they're definitely ornamental value to these trees. Um, they produce, they, they provide pollinator habitat. The blooms on these trees feed the bees, right? They feed the, the, the other insects, birds, bats, and so forth that are pollinators for some of our other plants. Some of them are actually native, right? So persimmons, walnuts, and hazelnuts are all native to this area of the country. Disadvantages is that they do take up a lot of space, right? A walnut tree can get 60 feet, 60 to 80 feet tall. And one of the things about walnut trees is you can't, it, it produces a substance in its roots and leaves that kind of ha kills off other plants. So if you've got a walnut tree, don't try to plant your tomatoes close to your walnut tree. Most of them require full sun or pretty close to full sun. So full sun is, is at least six at least six hours of sunlight a day, right? Six to eight hours is full sun. Most of them require pruning. There are diseases that will hit many of these, so be sure if you're gonna go with these, look for ones that are disease resistant or you will be spraying them all the, a lot, like f the fruit trees in particular. And then probably the worst of the nemesis for trees is squirrels. The so squirrels love the nuts, they love, I have two apple trees in my, ha in my yard, and last year I got not a single one because the squirrels ate every single one of them. I got a few. take a bite. No, actually they ate the whole thing. Oh. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the groundhogs will just take a bite, but the squirrels tend to eat the whole thing. <laughs> Um, but, you know, groundhogs actually, you think a groundhog is under the ground, groundhogs will climb trees as well. But they don't usually bother the fruit too much. Um, deer will eat your, your small fruit trees. So there are definitely, you know, critters that will go after them. Shrubs and brambles. So the shrub, so what's the difference between a, a tree and a shrub? Size. Size, right? So. And, and some of these actually, some of these plants can be grown as a tree or as a shrub. So cherries are one of those, right? So figs or fruits. Figs can be grown here, certain varieties of figs. Berries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, service berries, honey berries, and currants. And there are more of those options, right? So this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. Blueberries do really well here. We've got a fairly acidic soil in Lake County. And so blueberries are actually much easier to grow here than where I came from in Licking County, which is on the east side of Columbus. Um, raspberries and blackberries, some of those varieties are again are native. Um, service berries are native. Those are actually either trees or shrubs. Um, honey berries and currants. So these are, I'm sure that most of you like at least one of these. Service berries are sim very sim and honey berries are very similar to blueberries in taste. And, and sh yes? Service berries, are you talking about alamanchers? They're, they're it's, it's, that's the other name for it, and it, the birds like it, but I don't think. Well, that is not, I don't, does, any, does anybody else know, Carol? I said Amal Anchor. Amal is the. You have to sit out in your tree to get the bird. Yeah, bird. yeah, either that or you gotta Can cover them up. Those? Are they good to eat? Yes, berries? Yeah. if they're the same thing as service berries. Uh, yeah, I, I also know them as June berries or Saskatoons. Oh. Um, but, uh, but yes, they are, they are edible fruits, if you can beat the birds to them. Yeah. So most of these are very prolific. They produce a lot. They're easy to grow and relatively disease resistant. Um, again, check the variety. Um, some are native again. The disadvantage is you do have to prune most of these. There are diseases that will hit certain ones. Raspberries, for example, um, in particular, 
is, is once you get a, there's a disease in raspberries once you get it you if you want raspberries again plant them in a different location right so um, and then birds as you said right so a lot of these if you keep them small you can cover them with net but you know that takes a lot of work and so forth so vines are common vines grapes grapes are grown a lot here but there's also hardy kiwis and goji berries and they, again there are other options but these are some of the the ones that you might be interested in advantages obviously we all like grapes and wine and you know so it's excellent excellent um, fruit one of the things about grapes that i like you can eat the leaves you've heard of grape leaves right grape, grape leaf rolls that the uh, the Italians do you can eat grape leaves they take up less space than a lot of the bushes and trees because we grow them on an arbor right so it's we have to but you do have to have support for them right so you have to have these get pretty heavy they get big and heavy you know you see <laughs> grape vines right with the with the 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 braces are this big around right they, they get heavy and they need very substantial support they have to be pruned. I like to think of it as magic for how you prune some of these because they're, the way you prune them affects how they grow and how they produce. So it's not really magic, it's science, but you know, you, you get the idea. Again, you've got birds and bugs and diseases. So one of the things that I have found personally is that one of, the, one of our favorite bugs in Ohio and I say that sarca sar sarcastically, is the Japanese beetle, yeah. right? Japanese beetles seem to be most attracted to green beans and grapes. Once they find your yard, they'll eat everything else. So if you grow grapes or green beans, you're gonna have to f really fight the Japanese beetles. And there's probably others that they do too, they go after too, but those are the ones that, I, that I've found that they really seem to like, right? And they have devastated my grape arbor for years. So. <laughs> yes, sir? Does nookie spar actually work in Japanese? Uh, does milky spore actually work? for Japanese beetles? You know, that's a great question. Um, and I've heard both yes and no. So I, and I have never tried to use it myself, so I don't have any personal experience. Um, but I don't know if any of the other master gardeners in the room, Susan? I have used it and it did work for me. Okay. That's fine. That's a personal, that's not research-based. Yeah. Yeah, because I've actually seen testimonies that say it worked and some that say it doesn't. So I think you just got to try it and see how it works for you. Sorry, I can't do a research-based answer on that one because I don't know the answer. <laughs> okay, herbs. These are some of the common herbs that are perennial. Somebody had already mentioned chives, that they, their chives have already come up and they're, and they're going like crazy. Um, horseradish is also easy, an easy to grow herb that grows well here. Um, oregano, you, I showed you my oregano and thyme. Um, lemon balm is a lesser known herb, but it actually tastes like lemon. It's, a part, it's one of the mint family. Any kind of mint, any, you know, our typical mint, spearmint, peppermint, chocolate mint, they're very easy to grow. Um, the problem with mint is that once you put it in the ground, you will never get rid of it unless you're a fan of Roundup. Um, so, so I recommend mint in pots as opposed to in the ground unless you like the smell of mint when you mow. You don't. <laughs> Actually, I do. My mother, my, my in-laws um, had mint growing in their backyard, and I loved mowing their backyard, <laughs> actually, because it smelled awesome. But, you know, it's, it took over, so it takes over the yard. Um, sage 
is another one. Sage, is, uh, sage and thyme are actually shrubs. They are small shrubs. Um, rosemary is another one. I didn't put it up here because it's a little bit harder to grow here. It's, we are kind of right on the edge of whether or not it will survive the winter here. So if you put it in a protected place, um, you can overwinter it, but usually it doesn't make it. Yes, ma'am. Real quick, going back to mint, um, we heard that it keeps the rodents away. Is that true? Or well, so one of the nice things about herbs, and most of the herbs, is that they're, they're pretty mammal critter resistant, right? So very few of them will be attacked by mice, groundhogs, squirrels, deer, um, and sometimes, as, because the, the question was, does mint keep away rodents? I don't know that it will literally keep them away, but the smell of them, the strong smell of a lot of these, will deter them, right? Will deter them from being in a particular area if they, and, and it confuses them because most mammals use a lot more smell sensitivity than we as humans do, and it will, it will confuse them and they won't smell the plants that they think they want if they, if they have to cross over some of these herbs. So it's a great question. Um, so thyme and sage are both actual low growing shrubs, bushes, rosemary is too. Um, dill is a, is a prolific self-seeder, prolific. So, but it's very easy to pull out. Right, so it, if you pull it out, it's, it, it's done for, right? Um, unlike some of the other self-seeders that will actually grow back from its roots in that season, dill, once you pull it out, you're done, it's done. So, but it, it makes it really easy for, to plant it once and it comes back. If you let it go to flower, let it go to seed, um, it will come back the next year in the same location. I used to put it in my, my vegetable garden and then I would only let a few of them come back the next year right wherever it seeds and I use it a lot for making pickles dill pickles fennel could be on that list absolutely so they're beautiful um, many of these are ornamental um, if you remember when I list I showed you my sage I grow a variegated sage Right, which is a beautiful small little bush, right? Small, meaning like a foot and a half tall. The chives I also grow as an ornamental because they have these beautiful purple flowers, right? So if you look at this picture, there's the little purple flower. Um, the only thing about that is that if you let that little purple flower go to seed, it self-seeds too, very prolifically. Um, the same with lemon balm. Lemon balm is one of, the, although it's a mint family, it stays fairly well contained, oregano as well, unless you let it go to seed. So a lot of these, my recommendation is with the, so with chives, oregano, um, and lemon balm, and if you grow them for the flowers, cut the flowers off before they go to seed, or you will have lots of baby plants. So again, they may take over. So that's a disadvantage, right? And they may be edible plants, but because they're herbs, we don't use a lot of them, right? So that's kind of a disadvantage. They grow, they, they will, in three years, you'll have more than you probably can use, <laughs> right? Because they just keep growing and keep on giving and you've run out of uses. Yeah. All right, so that's the more, the kind of some of the more ones that are not vegetables. So what about vegetables? Somebody up here mentioned asparagus, right? So probably the most frequently thought of perennial vegetable is asparagus. So does anybody in here grow asparagus? A couple of you, great. Three of you, three or four. Um, used to. You used to? So asparagus is relatively easy to grow if you have the right conditions, right? So full sun, well-drained soil, um, 
don't disturb its roots and don't and let it grow for three years before you ever harvest it all right and then once you've once you do start harvesting it if it gets less than pencil thin stop harvesting for the year that's kind of the rule of thumb so somebody asked me the other day in a class can we can we force asparagus to come up earlier in the year and and I believe I don't know the answer for sure I believe the answer might be yes you know if we put plastic over it and keep it warm and so forth it might come up earlier however what defines the harvest season of asparagus is how much energy it has in its root system well how do you think that a plant gets energy into its root system in the middle of the winter anybody have an idea I'm sorry the Sun but asparagus actually dies back in the winter it's stored from the winter the summer before right so Sun is the correct answer but it has created all of that from the from the green leaves that it had the year before and then it has stored that energy in the roots if you don't have enough energy in the roots it won't produce new what's called fronds for asparagus new spears right and so if you cut them back too much during the year then they don't produce as much sugar and, and energy stored in the roots and therefore doesn't produce as much the next year so if it gets pencil thin or it's thinner quit harvesting it for the year that's my rule of thumb so if you could force it and get it to go earlier you still only have a you know a set season yes when do you cut that back then for the winter after it's pencil thin and you say i'm not going to har i'm not going to harvest that the fruit is gone but it'll grow so you let the you let the leaves grow and produce right, right? Asparagus, asparagus, right. Asparagus, can, asparagus can get this tall mm -hmm. it's this beautiful feathery leafy plant that can get four to four to six even eight I've even seen it eight feet tall um, and it's a beautiful landscape backward drop for a lot of other plants so the the question was when do you cut it back yes. for the winter yes. it will turn brown and then die any time after that between the time it dies back and the time that it starts to come back up the next year now a lot of the science-based kinds of answers will say um, if you leave it for the winter then diseases and pests can overwinter so the recommendation is cut it back in the fall after it after it turns brown yeah. okay. can I ask another question? sure uh, does asparagus need a lot of sand I heard that it needs a sandy soil it needs to be well drained it does, it doesn't needs, it does not need sand but it is a heavy feeder so it so compost and so the, and this is this is a whole other discussion about the way you plant asparagus um, you you trench you put in a trench and you bury it and and but you but in the trench you put in several inches of compost and you put lots of compost in with it and you feed it twice a year with compost or some other kind of fertilizer um, it will grow in it will grow in clay as long as it is well drained. Okay, did, we were having a discussion about sand. I bought some soil from a place and it seemed to be sandy. And does that retain water or does it drain? So sand retains less water than clay um, because of just the particle size. Of, because the difference between sand and clay is that clay is is really fine little particles as opposed to sand you know you can actually feel the grains right and so water particles actually the water molecules actually attach themselves to the surface of those grains and so clay will hold more um, but it also dries out and becomes much harder so it's organic matter that actually helps more with that um, but a lot of times you buy because organic matter actually also gives you air pockets and and it's so there's a whole this is a whole nother conversation um, but there's a whole 
you want some sand, some clay, some organic matter, but you also want air and water in your soil too, right? So the second most common perennial vegetable is rhubarb. All right, so I told you about rhubarb, I showed you my rhubarb that was coming up right now. So again, you don't eat the leaves of rhubarb. Again, you plant it and you wait at least one year before you harvest and the second year you harvest sparingly. Um, but it is, a, and it's a, again, it's a strong tasting. How many people like rhubarb? All right, great. But it is a very tart. It's, yes. it's very tart. So you have to, to either like very tart or figure out a way to use very tart or a lot of people put lots of sugar in with it, right? Oh. Strawberry rhubarb pie. Strawberry rhubarb pie. Also has a lot of sugar in it. <laughs> jam. Rhubarb jam? Uh, usually also has a lot of sugar. So um, there, are, there are recipes out where, there where you can use it without a lot of sugar, but you, know, you just have to, to experiment with how to use it. But it is probably one of, it is easier to grow than asparagus. I will tell you that. Um, it's, it's very easy and it comes up earlier. I mean, you saw my, my asparagus isn't coming up yet, but my rhubarb is, right? And so I will be having, I will be probably harvesting rhubarb with, by the, definitely by the end of the month. Um, I could probably harvest it in the next two weeks. May not be real big, but. So other vegetables that can be grown at, in my definition of perennial, right? So remember my definition of perennial is I plant it once and I harvest it for multiple years. A number of these, collards and kale, spinach, lettuce, and radishes are self-seeders, right? So, and collards and kale and Swiss chard are biannual, right? So I, I showed you my collards and kale those came up from seed that was self-sown last year and is now coming up this year as a new, as it, and it actually grew and I, I got harvest from it last year and now I'm getting harvest from it in the spring before it will then go to seed and plant itself again. So it's like a perennial, but it's a biennial. Bit. It is a biannual self-seeder. So <laughs> So there, in my definition, is a perennial food plant. As long as I don't pull it out, you know, and remove it from the, from from my garden space. Yes. Rhubarb. I bought some new bulbs, whatever you want to call them, uh -huh. and I plant them now. It says on the bag you have to wait till frost is done. No? So, so the question is, can do I have to wait until? No, there's no frost before I plant my rhubarb plant that I just purchased, mm -hmm. right? Um, I have planted it before the frost, the end of frost. Um, honestly, what I have right now, I plant, I've transplanted it from my previous house in February. Now, I had to wait two years. I waited two years before I actually started harvesting. But they say that because that, that's more guaranteed, right? So if you have frost or freeze like we had, you know, a couple of weeks ago when it was 20 degrees, right, um, it starts to die back. It'll, it'll kill off the, that, those leaves. So you probably, I would say, you probably have a higher chance of success if you wait but you could plant it in it, you might, it might work. How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> Very good. <coughs> yes. So basil doesn't self-pollinate. So yes, but the seeds don't survive the winter here. So they might, you know, if you, if you harvest the seeds, you can replant them the next year, but they will not survive our cold winters. Yes? I see you have nine star broccoli. Is that the only time that will do this? So I pulled that off of some website, and honestly, I have no idea how that works. <laughs> I'm sorry. I actually meant to take that off the presentation because although I've seen that, that what, what I read about it is that 
it does produce for multiple years. So you know how you, when you grow, so the, the question was, does, is nine star broccoli a, actually a perennial or, or a biennial? Because most broccoli is a, is a biennial, right? Um, so what I have read about it, with absolutely no experience, is that it's like other broccoli where you harvest the one central shoot, but then it will survive for multiple years and produce all those little side shoots. In, um, what's our zone here? Five, six. So in, this is like the, the height of the, the zone where that works, right? So if you're gonna try nine star broccoli, I would try to put it in a more protected place because it might not survive all the winters here. Radishes, radishes is a prolific self sower. Um, it will self sow within a season. So you can actually get two crops of radishes. However, once a radish goes to seed, then you no longer wanna eat the root, which is the part we eat typically, right? Um, because it gets hard and chewy and, and so forth. Okay, right. any other questions about these? Yes? What about uh, rabbits? And what about animals? rabbits and critters? Do they eat these? Um, yes, they love them. <laughs> <laughs> what do I recommend for keeping the rabbits out? Um, chicken wire. <laughs> I would put chicken wire around your, your garden space. Um, because they love all of these. Well, actually, they don't really go after the kale and collards. That's been my experience. But the rest of these, absolutely. The deer like them too. Yes? Someone told me once about planting marigolds around the garden, that that helps keep a lot of the critters out. So the question was, does marigolds keep the critters out? Um, you know, it's kind of like the same answer I had on the, the uh, mint. It deters them, but if they decide to go around them, you know, it kind of distracts them because, again, it's a, it's, it's a smelly flower and they have to be in flower. However, groundhogs like marigolds. So it might help with the deer and the rabbits, but it's not gonna help with the groundhogs. <laughs> at least the ones at my house do. <laughs> All right, so these are familiar and they're relatively easy to grow. In fact, these, a lot of these are things that most of us, if we annual vegetable garden, grow anyway, right? Um, but remember, if you're gonna grow them as perennials, they need to be in a space that you're not gonna disturb every year, right? Um, they can become bitter, especially the ones that are, are uh, self-seeding. Once they go to flower, you probably don't want to eat the plants anymore because they tend to be a much stronger taste. Um, lesser known vegetables. So there are ones that, that are vegetables that we can grow as perennials that a lot of us don't even know because we can't get them in the grocery store and we probably don't get them in the normal, in the normal um, nurseries. The first one is Jerusalem artichokes. Has anybody eaten Jerusalem artichokes? All right, a couple of you. And how would you describe the taste of a Jerusalem artichoke? Kind of like a potato turnip taste. Sort of a potato turnip taste. Nutty. Nutty. So I would say, I, w I would agree of the turnip potato taste, it's, it, they can be used, so you're eating the root just like a potato, um, and they can be used just like a potato. Um, and you'll see this picture on the right here is actually the plant, it's the flower. And I, one of the things that I like about growing Drusum artichokes is they are one of the last flowers still in bloom in my garden. They don't bloom until September and they can get 12 feet tall. So they're a beautiful plant, but again, they don't, they, don't, they don't grow, they don't bloom until late in the year. However, they will become weedy. If you don't harvest them every year, they, will, they can take over your garden. Very definitely. Did, was there a question back there? 
Are they also called sun chokes? Yes, they are. Sun, they are also called sun chokes, which is why I have that in, in here. Um, the other thing that people will tell you is that some people don't like Jerusalem artichokes or sun chokes because they make them fart. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so the next category of lesser known vegetables is Egyptian walking onions and garlic. Now these are things that we're familiar with garlic and, and onions, but there is a specific type of, of onion called the Egyptian walking onion, which is the picture on the right, which they produce these little bulblets on the flower, right? And when these little bulblets fall over, and then they they automatically like reseed themselves from those and it's just like planting little onion sets right so they basically reseed themselves every year and they will survive the winter which most onions will not in ohio garlic um, will self seed if you let so I don't know if any of you have grown garlic, but as it grows, it produces these, what the, the um, scapes. scapes, thank you, um, which is their little flower bud, and if you let that go to seed, it will produce seed. However, it takes about two to three years for seed to actually produce garlic that you can harvest. So typically what we do for planting garlic is we take apart the head and plant the little cloves, right? Because then the next year, or that, even that year, um, they produce an entire head, but with the seed, it takes several years for it to get that, that substantial. I think it's two years. Radishio, I can't pronounce that one. This is another one I have absolutely no experience growing. Um, it looks like a red, a, a red cabbage, but it's a very strong tasting red cabbage, but you can use it like red cabbage. Um, and I have absolutely no idea how it grows. Does, has anybody grown this? Or? Radicchio. Yeah, I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> it's radicchio. Rad radicchio. Radicchio. All right. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> then there are some greens, and there are more greens than that I've got list than I've what I have listed here. Broadleaf sorrel is this one, the one here on the the left um, that comes up relatively early in the year and it's a relatively strong tasting green. Lovage and Good King Henry. Those are all perennial plants that we eat, some people eat the greens for. So just like, you can use them just like spinach, whatever. The only thing that I would say is broadleaf sorrel is, can turn brown it turns brown depending upon the type of of pan you use if you cook it in a metal pan it will turn brown and so people tend to think that's kind of unappetizing potatoes did anybody know that did anybody believe that a potato is a perennial remember my definition of perennial i plant it and it comes back the next year if you don't dig all your potatoes out of the yeah. ground they will come back next year if you miss some they will come back yeah yeah. Flowers. Anybody know of any flowers that you can eat? Nasturtium. Nasturtium. Nasturtium I would not consider a perennial um, though. Okay. Pansies. 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 Daylilies. 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 <coughs> Borage. Borage. Borage I also would not consider a perennial. Oh actually I guess it does because it self seeds. Yeah. So daylilies. Thank you for that one. Um, daylilies are edible. Not just to the deer, they're edible for us as well. <laughs> we eat, we can, you can eat the, the entire flower and depending upon the variety, depends upon the taste, right? So some of them are more tasty than others. Uh, a lot of times people will say, take the, the pod, you know, so like this part here where it's just the flower pod and then kind of open it up, stuff it with cream cheese and it's really good. You can also eat the, the, the root, the tubers. How about roses? So the, the rose hips, which is the seed pod, um, as well as the flower itself, the petals are also edible. Um, and I, you know, I've got both of those growing in my yard. 
How about weeds? Dandelion. So dandelion, dandelion is the most well-known one. So a lot of our weeds are actually edible. Um, we consider them weeds because, you know, so what's the definition of a weed? A plant growing where you don't want it to grow. That's my definition. So I can have dill growing in the middle of my, veg my tomatoes and think that's a weed because that's not where I want it to be, but if it's growing over here where I've dedicated my dill plants to be, then it's no longer a weed, right? So dandelions actually were brought here to this country as a food plant. Makes good wine. They make good wine. So every part of the dandelion is edible with the exception of the flower stalk, the kind of milky flower stalk thing. All the rest of it is edible. If you are into that. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't spray them with a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So, but if you, but flowers and weeds, that's a whole nother conversation, right? So in foraging and so forth. So there's, there's a lot more to that that we're not gonna go into today. But my other favorite one, and I actually like it better than dandelions, is violets. Violets is another one where the entire plant is edible. Um, dandelions tend to have a very strong taste. In order to not have a very strong tasting leaf, you had to get it pretty early in its, in, before it blooms. That's not true with violets. Violets are, the leaves are very mild tasting, more like a spinach. Um, the flowers are pretty on top of things, you know, in salads and so forth, but, and uh, I've never eaten the roots, so I can't tell you what they're like. I, they're pretty small, so I don't know what I would do with them. So, but there's a lot of other weeds and, and flowers. Yes, ma'am. What about mushrooms? How are they classified? So mushrooms would be perennial. So the question was, how about mushrooms? And I did not include that because mushrooms are not technically a plant. Um, but mushrooms are perennial and some are edible. And if you are interested in that, I would recom highly recommend doing your research, working with people who really know about mushrooms, right? Because the, there are some that are not. And, and actually, I will, I will, let me restate that. All mushrooms are edible, some only once. <laughs> <laughs> so, so be very, and some, uh, the ones that are edible and, and that we eat are very, look very much like ones that are not. So, yeah, I'm not gonna comment on mushrooms too much, yes. My father-in-law used to pick mushrooms and give them to us. So I would wait a day after he ate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to repeat that, your father-in-law would harvest mushrooms and give them to you, and you would wait a day before you would eat them to make sure that they didn't, they had, didn't have trouble. Well, and, and so that's good, except that there are some people who respond differently to <laughs> some foods than others, right? So, um, but again, I, yeah, there's, there are organizations out there that teach you how to, that will teach you how to forage for mushrooms. And, that's way beyond this course, in my knowledge. Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to say, foraging for mushrooms, when I was a young marine, I was like 20, I was always a gardener, so uh, I thought I knew plants. I went and I used to forage when I would be in the bush, uh, make my own salads out of plants. I found some mushrooms. Oh, these look good. Ended up in the hospital. <laughs> so, yep. Sure. Yep. Yeah, well, mushrooms. One very toxic. Yes, there are some that are extremely toxic. Some that will kill you. Very, you wouldn't have been in the hospital. Yeah, you would have. Was called the angel of death. Yeah. yeah. Oh really? I'm surprised it didn't kill you. There's a reason that's called the angel of death. <laughs> yes, sir. Chicory root makes a good coffee substitute. So does dandelion root. Dry roast it. Dry roast it, yep. So you gotta dry it first, and then you grind it up, and I'm not sure what you do from there. I'm not a coffee person, so either way. And I don't think that it has caffeine, does it? Yeah, so it's a decaf, it's a naturally decaffeinated coffee substitute. What about the tea plants? What about tea plants? I don't know. Are they selling them as perennials in, in this area? Yeah, it would be a little bush. 
Um, but I wouldn't, ex I don't know if it will grow here over the winter. I have no idea. Yeah, I didn't think they were full parties. I didn't, didn't think so. I mean, you could put them in a pot and, you know, bring them in in the winter. Bay is the same way, right? You can put them, you can put them into a pot and bring them in in the winter. Um, but they don't survive here, I don't think. I don't know if it's a perennial or not, but plantain is a good salad. Plantain was another weed. Again, you're getting into that whole foraging thing. It's another weed that, that is edible, and yes, it is, a it is a perennial as well. And actually, you can eat not only the, um, the leaves, but you can also eat the seeds if you can have the patience to harvest them. Yes, sir. What's your experience with <coughs> invasive weed called Pernella vulgaris? Have you heard of it? It's called self heal. It's called, um, what's its common name? Self heal. Self heal. Um, I have a lot of it in my yard. <laughs> so, so what's your, what's the question? What's your experience with it besides having it in your yard, like everybody else does? Um, so I nibble on it occasionally. That's about my and and it grows in my yard. That's my experience. Do you believe that it helps you health wise? <sighs> <laughs> I do not know the answer to that. I nibble on it, I don't know. I mean, obviously there's a lot of, so you think about our, our modern medicine is all based on science and research and so forth. There is a lot, and, and the problem is it's all based upon what was funded, right? And, and Abbott Labs doesn't get, doesn't make money if they sell something made from self-heal. Right, because they can't patent it because it's, an, it's a plant, right? So there's no research, not to say it doesn't heal, but there's no research that has been funded to prove one way or the other. And so it's all anecdotal. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Any other questions? Yes? Fiddlehead ferns? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Fiddlehead ferns? Fiddlehead ferns. So, so the question is, are fiddlehead ferns edible? Is that, so are you just listing them as another possibility? Yes. Okay, so, fiddle, so fiddlehead ferns, so what she's talking about is most fern plants, if you've seen them, they kind of come up, when they first bring their fronds up, they kind of have this little spirally thing, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the fiddlehead of the fern, and many of them are edible. Some taste better than others. Um, again, there are some that, are, that will make you sick, so be careful which ones you get. Make sure you do your research if, if that's what you want to go for. But yes, there are some. And it's kind of, I've been told that they kind of taste like asparagus, if you get good ones. Ostrich fern is the one I grow. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Um, purslane, is that how you say it? Purslane. So you guys are into the weeds here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so purslane is also considered a weed for most people. Yes, it is edible, um, and it's it, it's it's a succulent type of plant weed that's very low growing with some flowers that you know only the the leaves are very small. Um, to eat that, typically you just take the whole stem and leaf and everything. Thank you. Yum, yum. Um, yes. What about parsley? Um, oh. Would that be a self-seeder? So parsley is a biannual self-seeder. So the next year, would it be as good as the fir or? So, so it's parsley, is, so remember I said don't pick it once it goes to flower? Parsley actually becomes somewhat toxic once it starts to send up its flower shoot which is why most people do not recommend that you, you actually keep it over the second year. But early in the spring, I mean, my parsley's starting to come up now. I will harvest it until it sends up that flower shoot and then I pull it out. Or I let it go to seed so that, it, but parsley seeds are harder to germinate. They, it's just, they don't have as high of a germination rate um, and they don't last as long. And I don't know by the time they bloom and then really get going, because they take a while to go to get going, by the time our season is over, then they're pretty mu they're barely getting going before they 
before they um, before the winter comes. So, so better to, uh, tear them out at the end of the season. So what I do with parsley is, is I let them overwinter, if they will, because sometimes they survive, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I use it as being able to harvest them early in the spring and before they go to flower, before m my next newly purchased yeah. s plants come up, really get going. Okay. Good question. Did you have a question? Yeah. So how much success would I have container gardening lettuce and maybe small potatoes. So the what question would I, what, would I, what would I have to do? So the question was how much success is there with container gardening for lettuce and potatoes? So lettuce and potatoes absolutely can be grown in containers. Um, the thing about container gardening is to make sure that you keep them watered because anything in that container dries out much faster than what's in the ground, right? So you have to pretty much keep on top of it of watering it every day or every other day. Just make sure that you're checking the soil. But absolutely, both of those can be grown in containers. Actually, they need to be bigger than average containers? So let us know. Okay. Lettuce can be grown, you only need a couple of inches of soil, you can grow in a small, actually you can leave it in the pot, it comes, you know, the, the little four inch pots if you wanted to. Um, potatoes, however, will, you need to, to grow them the way you would grow them in the ground, right? So, um, so you have to, you have to kind of bury them and so that, you know, they don't, they don't get sunlight and, yeah. and you need, they usually recommend for potatoes that it's like a five gallon bucket or, you know, the big pots that are like this big. Yeah. So and then over the winter, do you just bring those containers in the garage? So what happens with potatoes is that they... Um, they just grow back from the potatoes that you didn't harvest the day the year before that you missed, right? So even if it's only this big, right? It'll gr it can grow a new potato. Um, so those you can just throw those back in the in your pot again next year. The lettuce you could actually bring in and you can grow on your windowsill if you wanted to. Um, lettuce goes to seed. It it will send up its flower shoot typically when it gets too hot. And so, and then go to seed from that. Did that answer your question? Does. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Using rainwater that has more nitrogen than oxygen in it to water your plants better than just using spigot water, which is fluoridated. So the question is: Is rainwater better for your plants than than tap water? Than our our treated, chlorinated. Um, tap water. The answer to that is yes, rainwater is typically better as long as you are careful that it is not contaminated with other toxin kinds of things and or it hasn't sat long enough that it's breeding mosquitoes. You don't want to, you, you want to make sure that you've harvested it in a manner that you're not breeding mosquitoes in it. Mosquitoes? Yes. Yes, sir. Well, I put in a rain barrel many years ago, and it was not recommended to use rainwater for food because it comes off your roof. You don't know what what's been on your roof, or right. roof and anything else. Yeah. So that so an expansion water. to his question so is you don't can use it for non-food stuff. But should if you did use it, make sure it's just on the. If you did use, it, make sure you put it on the dirt, <coughs> so not on the any leafy part. Yeah, so the recommendation for using rainwater in a rain barrel off of your roof is to use it on ornamentals only, and if you use it, or if you, or certainly not actually watering, so that the water you use does not touch the plant, so you're watering the ground, not the plant, which is a good recommendation anyway, right? When you water, you really should be watering the, the ground rather than the plant. Um, but it's, uh, and the reason is because of the toxins that it can pick up off an asphalt shingle roof. So I have my, I, I don't have it in yet, but my intention is to put a uh, rain barrel on my shed, which has a metal roof, which does not have the asphalt toxins. Why not just collect rainwater in an open container like a plastic little barrel and then store that in, in bottles for later use. You can. So the the recommendation is can you store can you capture it in barrels and just off just at rain. The problem <laughs> takes a lot. 
of rain to get much water that way. Right, so you think about um, just a five gallon bucket, you get an inch of rain, you're only gonna have an inch of water in that five gallon bucket. Whereas if you've collected it off of your roof, you can get a whole bunch of water, right? So it works, but it takes a lot longer. A lot more rain. Yes, sir? Is wild ginger edible? Wild ginger, is wild ginger edible? The answer is yes in moderation. Yeah, it, I, the recommendation is don't eat a lot of it. That's all I can tell you. Wild ginger. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you guys for coming. And if you didn't sign in on your way in, please do so. There's also information on future programs that we're doing um, with the Master Gardener program. And if you've got any questions, let's just let me know. Thanks.